So the question is, what is chronic fatigue, black mold, and Sears? Who's heard of Sears before? Ever heard of Sears? Okay. Uh, what do you know it to be? Those of you who've heard of it, what do you know it to be? What do you have you heard of it as being? Chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Okay. Uh, so it's really this is all this, these are different names for the same disease, in one fashion or another. These are all different names for the same disease, and black mold is probably the one that's the most commonly talked about and thought about, and so that's the one we're going to give an example tonight. So I'm going to explain why you might feel so tired. At the, t at the end of the night, I want everybody to say, if I'm feeling fatigued, this might be contributing to it. And then we're going to understand what Sears means and what it, what it stands for, and some understanding of the pathway of the Sears inflammatory process, and try to simplify it down into a relatively complex treatment algorithm that we're going to go through both by treatment and by diagnosis, so you see it from a couple different ways, a couple different times, and hopefully give you some hope. Well. If you'd come to my house, you'd recognize the wallpaper there. <laughs> and you'd recognize that this is the door closed on the bathroom, which means the person taking this picture is on the throne. And if the door is open, you don't see that. What's that? Well, it turned out it wasn't mold, thank goodness, but it was a broken <laughs> pipe. It was a broken pipe underneath our... our uh, the, the flooring underneath the tile because we have baseboard heat. Mm -hmm. And so the pipe, which our house is 70 years old, and our, one of our pipes had broken and water was wicking up, water was wicking up the wall. If we had left that alone, that would have turned into, well, I did find this picture. Fortunately, that's not my house. But you've probably all seen this someplace sometime 30% of American buildings are water damaged. The older they are, if you live in a home that's more than seven or eight years old, you've probably had some water damage in it because a tree has fallen on your roof and loosened some shingles, a uh, plumbing has broken somewhere, uh, a child has played in the bathtub and uh, splashed water in the bathtub and leaked all through the ceiling. I saw that ceiling last this last weekend. Uh, there's lots of reason for getting water leaks and damage in your house, or your basement flooded a little bit because your sump pump died, or blah, 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 blah. Lots of reasons. But roughly 30, but guess, guess what the likelihood of being water damaged if the building is over 50 years old? It's like almost 100%. How many college buildings are over 50 years old? Mm -hmm. How many post offices are over 50 years old? How many school buildings are over 50? So Holly and I were going down to a nice little Mexican restaurant in Tosa and we were driving down, we passed a school building that says established 1878, and I thought, that's an old building, that's 150 years old. So many people may not feel symptoms in one place, but they will in another. So what we're going to talk about then is we're going to go through all these things. So Sears, Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, is actually set up by many environmental toxins. Uh, mold is probably the classic example and the most common. Oh, please come in. Just find a place. Uh, but any, who's heard of ciguatera? Okay. And that stands for? It's fish. fish poisoning. It's red tide. We're going to actually talk about Shoemaker, how we got there. Uh, who's heard of Lyme disease? Everybody, if you live in Wisconsin. Uh, but br how about brown recluse spider bites? We have those here. Right. Anybody ever had one of those? Anybody ever heard of somebody getting one and then being sick for a long time afterwards? Right. Uh, Fisteria poisoning is another one that's actually being challenged right now because we're not sure if that's real or not. So let's just start with mold. Here's some of the literature on black mold and what's now in the published literature. I just want to show you some of the stuff that's out there. Detection of mycotoxins in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome is basically the house of medicine saying, we don't have a clue what's going on with you, so we give up. So we're going to give you a label and tell you to go see a psychologist or something like that. You know, rule number two in medical school is when in doubt, blame the patient. You know, whatever. <laughs> so. But look at this. 80% of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome have okra toxin in their urine. 2% of folks without chronic fatigue syndrome have it. 
So chronic fatigue syndrome may be a mold illness. So you're going to hear this story is just starting. And I think we're going to start seeing more and more diagnoses as we coalesce this diagnosis, as we coalesce this problem, and we learn to think about it and talk about it and do research on it. We're going to see more and more of this happen. So okra toxins, easily measurable. Uh, so here's chronic fatigue syndrome, 112 patients, 55 controls, uh, different toxins in their control patients, zero, 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 zero. Control patients don't have them. Folks with chronic fatigue do. So maybe this basket case that we've called chronic fatigue syndrome, we're testing things that look normal, and you go see a regular doctor and you get a blood count and a chem panel, and they say, you look gorgeous, honey. And you go, why don't I feel better? Something happened to me where things suddenly got different, and I don't feel good. Uh, oopsie daisy, what did I push? Oh, here we go. And the statistical significance is P.0001, you know, way out there. So we're beginning to realize that we should probably be paying attention to it. And how come we haven't picked this up earlier? What's going on that we haven't understood this? Well, the conclusion, indoor water-damaged environments contain a variety. It's not just mold. They contain a variety of mold and bacterial species that produce mycotoxins, volatile organic compounds, exotoxins, and other metabolites that are present in the dust and the furnishings. So it's not just the mold. So if you, put out, if you put out a mold detection unit, and there are mold detection units you can put in your house that will catch spores, you know what percent of the poisons you'll catch? Less than 1% of the stuff that causes chronic fatigue syndrome because it's not the whole mold spore. You need the whole spore to get a new colony of mold going, but that's not what's making you sick. It's the pieces of protein and the pieces of DNA that are making you sick. And so you can't go looking for the mold spore and think you're going to find it. So it's not the spores, but the DNA, the proteins, and the pieces of mold. And along with mold, there's almost always this bacteria called actinomyces. Anybody here ever take a microbiology course? Actinomyces is a funny-looking bacteria that's sort of halfway between bacteria and fungus and sometimes a bacteria and sometimes a, a mold, and we're not sure quite what it is. It's, it's its own family. But it sure shows up when you have water-damaged buildings. It's probably part of that slime, slippery, messy, gooey mess anytime you get a mold colony going. So what does the literature say about this? The occupants of these environments experience chronic adverse health effects that range from upper and lower respiratory disease, central and peripheral neurological deficits, chronic fatigue-type illness, among others. Okay, and published in 2003. And polite language was saying, these folks have weird symptoms that we can't figure out. They have chronic symptoms that we just aren't sure what they are because they haven't figured out. And so the, the question is their connection. Patients that remain chronically ill after exposure to water-damaged buildings very commonly demonstrate mycotoxin in their urine. Well, that's interesting. Yes? So if you get yourself out of that environment, uh -huh. are you better? Or? Oh, oh, keep listening. Okay, keep okay. listening. Okay. I didn't pay her. I promise you. I promise you. I didn't. No, that I was a. Can, can you just can you go back to that? Can well, I go whatever. back? There was something in that, like I think it was past tense, like had been exposed. Oh, you're you're parsing too much. That's, you're talking okay. to somebody with bad grammar. So, uh, let, let, let's let's keep going because you're going to get an answer to that question. Uh, pop quiz. Mold illness is part of a larger family of conditions called Sears. Okay, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Give three causes of Sears: mold, red tide, Lyme disease. Okay, that you get three. That's good. Spider bite. Okay. There's probably there's probably chemical exposures. It's probably probably many things because, for example, how many people here are sensitive to poison ivy? Not everybody. Do you know that about half of us get a free pass with poison ivy? Do you know what happens? Do you know that everybody gets one free pass on poison ivy? The first time you get poison ivy, no big deal. Second time you get poison ivy, uh. third time, fourth time, nuclear explosion. Okay, so your immune system gets ramped up and trained. And so maybe folks who live in places where there's lots of poison ivy 
So when I was an emergency doctor in Ottumwa, Iowa, the folks who used to mow the freeway, there was poison ivy in Ottumwa like you wouldn't believe it. And the folks that mow the freeway in summer would get the poison ivy aerosolized and they'd get in their eyes and they'd come in and just horribly sick. They'd come into the ER and we'd give them all sorts of steroids. They were just horribly sick. Uh, okay. The criteria is simple, straightforward criteria. Right. Yeah, you must be kidding. So is there a way to treat it? Studies have demonstrated success with treating patients with intranasal amphotericin B. This was shown in both Sears patients and those with chronic illness following mold exposure. That was published in 2005. But it comes up short, because folks don't always get better. So simple nasal treatment with amphotericin doesn't always work. So, but this is the standard internal medicine infectious disease approach has failed. And so we haven't quite understood why it didn't work. So what's next? And the question is, where do you start? When you've seen somebody who says, I've been to five doctors, and all they say is that I'm a little bit wacko. And uh, everyone uh, runs from their presentation, and they give me antidepressants. Because I have so many symptoms that challenge them, and they change, and they don't stay in the one place. If you're seeing that picture, that person has mold or sears. And what ha what's happening, you're going to understand by then this evening why that's happening. And you have to look at, so if you look at, there's a variety of other ways of looking at it. So the Lyme fee people give out a questionnaire. And the questionnaire goes through about 50 questions. And it's got, that's got about, oh, 20 of them are pretty obscure and diffuse, like do you have aching in your neck or do you, you know, how fatigued are you, one to five, or things like that. And some of you have, have filled out that Lyme questionnaire. Or how many of you have heard of the VCS test? A couple of you have seen it, okay. And taken it, and seen it, okay, good. But you can do a couple tests, and we're gonna go through those tests when we get there, but let me, let me keep going through. But when we talk weird symptoms, we mean really weird symptoms. For example, joint aches that move. You have them in this joint one day, and that joint the next day. Or, I can't lift my arms. Oh, give me a break. I can't lift my arms. I can't get out of bed. I can't lift my, I can't lift my legs and get out of bed. Uh, my neck hurts. Stabbing pain. I feel like I have stabbing pain, like an ice pick in the back of my head. And then it goes away. Or fatigue or shortness of breath or cough or chest pain. Or skin sensations or vibrating. Lyme disease is known by, or the co-infections of Lyme are commonly of things like bottom of my feet are burning. You know, some of those kind of things. You say, how does that make sense? You go, oh, well, I, I sort of believe it, I guess. Or tingling that comes and goes, or headache, or dizziness, or memory loss, or word loss, or light sensation, or, or mood issues. These are all the kind of things that make traditional internal medicine hide behind their desk. And they say, because there's no explanation for them. We don't know how to put, put, a, put a name on it. So this is where we give a pause to Richie Shoemaker. How many folks have heard of Richie Shoemaker? Oh my gosh, good, this is half of you. Pardon me while I tell the other half about Richie Shoemaker. Richie Shoemaker is a family doctor 20 years ago in Pocomoke. He's now sort of retiring from practice because he's been working on this for like 30 years and he's, turned, he's trying to go into teaching doctors more about it. And he was in Maryland, in Pocomoke, Maryland, on the Chesapeake Bay at the time of a red tide. And do you know what a red tide is? You know, when the water all turns red, there's a bunch of little, there's trillions of little dinoflagellates, and fish eat them. And fish get the poison in them, and then people catch the fish, and they eat the fish, and they get sick. And that's where ciguatera poisoning comes from. Well, he hadn't heard about the red tide. He didn't know about it. All he knew is he had a couple of people come to him with very weird, odd complaints, and he was clueless. He did the blood count and a chem panel, and he found nothing wrong. You look great. And he saw about 10 of these people. And one of them happened to have relatively high cholesterol. So he thought, okay, I'm going to treat them with cholesterol. And the first statin, so he said, I'm allergic to it. So he said, okay, well, I've got an old-fashioned statin drug here called cholestyramine. And he gave that person cholestyramine. And two weeks later, they called him up and they said, I'm completely better. I feel great. He thought, that's weird. They're not meant to feel great from cholesterol, and their cholesterol hadn't changed any. 
But he thought, let's try that cholesteramine on somebody else. So he gave it to another one of his patients who were having weird symptoms, and they got better. And he got interested. He said, what's going on? This is doing something different. Cholestyramine is not a drug. It's a binding agent. It binds chemicals. And so when you take it orally, it binds chemicals. And one of the things mold does is it circulates through your bile into your gut and then back into your gut, back through your blood, and then into your bile and into your gut and back out because your immune system doesn't recognize it, doesn't get rid of it, and you keep reabsorbing it. And so it stays in your body because you get it in your sinuses and you get it in your co throat and you cough up some phlegm and swallow it and you cough in, some, some in your sinuses and swallow it. And so it's, make, it's going on in your sinuses and your gut and it just persists. But if you take the cholestyramine, you get rid of it and it sucks it out of you and you break that cycle. So it turns out, he, once he got going on that, that was the beginning of his journey. And he started learning, he said, what is it that I'm measuring? How can I measure it? How can I reduce it into a way that's identifiable? So people were coming to him from all over the East Coast with mold disease. Guess how popular you are if you go to your boss at a building and say, I have mold disease. <laughs> right, this goes over like a lead balloon. And so you tend to find yourself ostracized and criticized, and the person says, show me the proof. So Richie Shoemaker has basically fought about, oh, because people came to him, he found himself in the middle of many legal battles. And he realized he was operating to a standard of court proof. And so he said, we have to make a process that we can prove by literature and prove by testing so that people can be properly defended. And so you can understand it. So what I'm going to go to tonight is Richie Shoemaker's system. And that's what I want you to learn, and I'm going to try to explain it. So anytime you get a little confused, stop me, and I will go through it and try to make sure so each step you understand it. So the first thing he does is to say, okay, you come to me with a bunch of weird symptoms that nobody else can figure out. That makes my little antennae go up. And I say, yep, we've got to think about mold. And then they do a VCS test. So about a, third, a couple of you have taken a VCS test. Here's a VCS test. If you start looking at this with one eye, you only see one dot at a time. Imagine just seeing one dot. And you'd look at that dot and you'd say the lines are straight up and down. And then you'd look at that dot and say they go to the left or right. Well, that one looks to the right. That one's to the right. That one's straight up. That one's a little left. Well, well, well. And where does your vision finally play out? Well, it turns out that when you're affected by mold illness, your brain can't differentiate between black and white as well. So somebody who isn't affected can see those dots, but somebody who is can't. Now, Dr. Shoemaker maintains it's 100% effective. Well, maybe not. And I've already had one client who passed their visual test and had four blood tests that were grossly positive. So... Like all good medical tests, trust it to about 80%. Bad medical tests, you trust to 50%, which means they're not very good. Uh, okay, but then you do a VCS test, and that basically becomes a screening test, so it's moderately helpful. It, I don't believe it's going to be perfect, but it's moderately helpful at helping you see if you're getting better or worse. And besides, it's cheap. So if I can do that in 15 minutes, and the shoemaker charges 15 bucks for it, so it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's, this comes off of his website. I don't know if it's his inf invention or not, but we charge $15 for it that way. And then you do some lab. How many have heard of TGF beta 1? I have yet to find one doctor who's ever heard of TGF beta 1. Isn't that interesting? I hadn't heard of TGF beta 1 as of about six months ago, so this is new for me too, so I'm on this learning journey. But basically, it's a cytokine that's a really interesting cytokine. It's called transforming growth factor. That's why it's TGF, transforming growth factor. And it goes through the roof with mold illness. In fact, it's explosive. The more time you're exposed to mold, the higher it goes. And as it goes up, it has a whole bunch of secondary effects. But it's one of the cytokines that causes damage all over you. And we're going to get to some of the more damage, but it probably causes apoptosis, which is self-death of B cells. So it suppresses your B cells. Mm -hmm. And it's probably part of why CD57 drops in Lyme disease. 
is your TGF beta 1 goes up. So here's something we can measure that's looking at your immune function. Guess what happens if you send a TGF beta 1 to hospitals in Milwaukee? You have to put it on dry ice. So they say, well, you have to go to the main hospital and do there. And then guess what happens when they do it there? Then they send it out to Quest. Because they don't do it themselves, they send it to Quest. Guess what happens to the dry ice on the way to Quest? No. It doesn't work. So the only place to get a TGF beta 1 is at Quest Labs. You have to go to Quest Labs. I have discovered all those problems on my own. So for those people who are in this audience tonight, please forgive me for having sent you off to a hospital. I'm so mad at the hospitals, I've now had three people come back saying, I tried, I tried, I tried. I'm just, I'm now giving up, recognizing that I'm in the process of trying to train the Milwaukee hospitals to do these labs, and the, the peripheral lab places can't do it. I don't have dry ice in my office, but the hospitals can't do it either. You have to go to a Quest lab for, for some of these labs. Okay. MSH. Ever heard of MSH before? See, doctors have never heard of any of these. This is melanocyte-stimulating hormone. Melanocyte-stimulating hormone was discovered as the hormone that makes us get a tan, makes your melanocytes get tan. That's a cool little hormone. I suspect the beauty industry would love to learn how to stimulate it if you could make a tan with it. But that's not what happens in mold illness. What happens in mold illness is it disappears probably is some response to cytokines of which TGF beta 1 is one. But MSH is central to mold illness. And it suppresses or controls a whole lot more than just melanocytes. It stimulates endorphins, your natural pain control. So if you don't have enough endorphins, what happens to your sense of pain, to your feeling of chronic pain? So people who have mold illness frequently hurt a lot because their pain control systems have gone goofy. What happens to your nerve function? You start having goofy nerve function, so you feel stabbing pain in funny places, or you feel tingling on the bottom of your feet, and so the doctor rolls his eyes and looks at you. You can't regulate your food intake for appetite. Your appetite gets wacko. So you gain weight, and you, don't, you can't control your weight gain, so you're overweight, and you can't lose weight. Uh, it messes up your hormones. It messes up your energy. It messes up your invading microbes, so you can't defend yourself against infections. So you get chronic infections of other kinds. So MSH is a huge player in this whole picture. And I'm going to show you a graph. Shoemaker has a wonderful graph that puts it all together, and that's why I'm going to go over all those things about three or four times you get it. Could I just ask? Sure. H, is that for hormone or for factor? That stands for melanocyte-stimulating hormone. But you had the word factor typed up there. Okay. Oh, look at that. That's what happens when you prevent a slideshow. You do it the first time and then you get it better. It'll be, it's MSH, melanocyte-stimulating hormone. Okay. Um, you mentioned Quest Labs. Do you have a number or where? where do Actually, if you go? Google Quest Labs, uh, the Wheaton, I'm sorry, it's not the Wheaton system, the whatever the new name is. Yes, Ascension. Apologize if there's any Ascension people here. But the Ascension system has made a contract with Quest, but there are three Quest labs here in town where you can actually go to and get them. But all the entire Ascension system is going to have a contract with Quest. But my belief is that you'd probably be best served of making sure you go to a Quest draw site to do that. Uh, then you get an HLA test. Oh, yeah, it has to be a doctor's prescription. Well, it has to be a doctor's prescription if they're going to pay for it, if your insurance pays for it. Uh, if you go on your own and get it, these will be a couple hundred bucks a piece. So they'll be expensive. You want to get a doctor's prescription. But an HLA test, how many people here know what HLA stands for? Okay, here's what HLA stands for. It's what makes you, you. It's what's called tissue typing. It's the antigens that your cells put on to say, I'm John Whitcomb or you are you. And when you get a kidney transplant, and I say, I want to match you with your sister, hope you have a sister, <laughs> you have a one in four chance of being a perfect match with your sister. But you have a one in 250 million, gazillion, I don't know what the number is, probably 25 million of having a match with me. So any one person only has probably three or four matches in all the United States. That kind of thing. So when you hear about that happening with tissue, with kidney transplants and stuff like that, 
So HLA is tissue typing. Okay, you got that? Well, it turns out tissue typing unleashes the mystery of what's going on with mold illness. And if, if you get to H, a, the HLA tissue typing, you will find tissue types, 70% of which are absolutely completely innocuous. 70% of human beings can lie in a bathtub full of black mold and they can just have it for lunch. And their immune system can see it and can label it and can get rid of it. So the majority of people handle mold. Not everybody, though. 30% of people are modestly sensitive, and their immune system can kind of see it, sort of, but not well. And they get sick if they're exposed enough. But 2% of people are walking catastrophes, and their immune system is absolutely blind. They can't see it at all, and they're like being walked over like a steamroller. 2% is a lot of people. 2% in Milwaukee is 20,000, 30,000 people. Isn't that interesting? So some of us are exquisitely sensitive. But because that 2% is relatively small, the house of medicine hasn't seen it. Because we tend to look for the... When you do a large population study, you take a group of 250 random people, and you test them all, and 2% disappears in those 250 people. So you don't see it unless you look for that specific sensitivity. Yes? An uh, allergy type thing, they can say you have mold issues, pollen, mold. So do you differentiate? Uh, allergy testing is checking for the antibody IgE. Okay. And allergy testing IgE is an allergic response to it that, in fact, your immune system is seeing it just fine, thank you very much, with the allergic system that then makes you get allergic type responses. And allergic kind of responses are sneezing, hay fever, asthma, uh, uh, hives. And some of those allergic, if they're explosive, can be dangerous. That's the IgE system. The IgG system is what are the antibodies in your blood that make for inflammation in your blood. And that's what's going on here, the IgG and IgA system. So I should have differentiated that. That will be on the next time I do this talk. Okay. So once you interpret the HLA test, and I have also bungled that here in town because I found out that there's the hospitals don't do the HLA interpretation in a way that you can get a categorization of whether they're mold sensitive. So it turns out that uh, you have to get this from LabCorp. And I'll get to that when we go over the test. I'll actually give you the number so you can get it precisely. So, because that is only available from LabCorp. So, wouldn't it be nice if they were all available? Here's the test number 167120. That's LabCorp's test number 167120. I've now actually memorized that. But if you get that test from LabCorp and get the HLA testing back from LabCorp, you can go to this website, the website, myhousemakesmesick.com. And they will take the they will take the lab core lab data and give you a a grid that you can plug into and you can interpret your own test. So there is a way of actually doing this, but it takes there's nuance to it because it hasn't been made user friendly yet. We haven't got a user friendly way of looking at it. But this will make it user friendly. That's why you're here tonight. And this is what the calculator does. The, this is the calculator on my house makes me sick, and you just go, you get the DRB1, you plug it into DRB1. You get the DRB1, you put that into there. And you just fill in all these spaces all the way down from the lab core one, and the little computer spits out an answer and said, nah, you're fine. Or, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, would you like to buy life insurance? I don't know what they do on the third, <laughs> but there's other things you can test, and this is where this is where we begin to see there's a variety of impacts that mold has that I'm going to get, make sense for you in a couple of minutes when we get to POMC. Cardiolipins and gliadin. There's a pretty high tendency of once you get mold sick, you make your immune system get goofy. Your MSH is suppressed, so your immune system starts being goofy. And wheat, we know that gluten makes you have leaky gut. Well, everybody gets leaky gut from wheat. Everybody. Not everybody responds to it. Not everybody makes antibodies to it. But if you have mold and your immune system is damaged, you'll start getting allergic to wheat. 
and then you'll get, by golly, you'll suddenly become much more sensitive to wheat, and there you'll have all these antibodies, IgM and IgG antibodies. And you go, oh. So if you have, if you have somebody with mold illness and you check them for these things, you'll find out they suddenly developed these antibodies. They never had them before. Well, where'd that come from? Do they have, are they really that sensitive to mold? Or are they really that sensitive to wheat? And you'll find out once you treat them and heal them, they can possibly go back to eating wheat later, but they might not. But one thing you do while you're trying to calm them down is you want to calm their immune system down. So for the time being, take them off of wheat. Stop eating wheat because that's just setting you off. But, you know, test it first. So that's some of the antibodies you can test for. C3A and C4A. C3 and C4A. These are tests that also have to be done at Quest. Can't be done anywhere else. I'm sorry. These are the ones that you have to be on dry ice. I'm pro the previous one did not. This is the ones that have to be on dry ice. And these go through the roof. C4A goes through the roof. Okay? Sears frequently has as much as 10,000. Folks who have really a rip-roaring case of Sears will have 10,000. Second time illness, 20,000. Third time illness, 50,000. If you get sick and then get completely fixed and then get sick again because you go back into the same old building, you can just do this again and again because your immune system gets trained and trained and trained and you keep exploding harder and harder. So folks will describe going into a water-damaged building and they'll say they have five minutes to get out before their C4A starts activating. If they don't get out in five minutes, and I was talking to somebody this weekend who said she went to a wedding this last summer, uh, six months ago, with her daughter, and they walked in the church, and the daughter said, I can't be in here. Mm -hmm. said, I'm feeling sick. And she said, I have to get out. And she said, I missed the wedding. I, just, I couldn't go in. She was, that building had so much mold in it. Okay. Uh, ERMI testing. Anybody ever gotten here, gotten an ERMI test? A couple of you? Okay. An ERMI test is Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. And it's a clever way of saying, okay, so if it's not the spores, we've got to start looking for what it is. What is it that's really causing trouble? It's the DNA fragments, it's the proteins that are getting out and causing trouble. And you find that in house dust. All right? Who here has a perfectly clean house? <laughs> you have too much time on your hands. <laughs> so I had no trouble collecting ERMI at test in my house. And I just went, I thought, hmm, fan blades. Bingo. Boy, did I get good dust there. You, set, you go to uh, this company, mycometrics.com. Oh, I didn't put it on here. Mycometrics.com. M-Y-C-O-M-E-T-R-I-C, mycometrics.com is a company that will send you an ERMI kit, and all they send you in the kit is a nice Swiffer rag. And you take the, you take the rag, and you wipe off any part in your house where you, you don't want your mother-in-law to see. You know, the top of your fan blades, or the top of the bureau in the bedroom, or way back behind the dresser at the very back where the, you know, the vacuum cleaner can't reach, or under your bed deep, where only the dog goes. You know, all those places where you have dust bunnies, that's what you want. You want to swipe that until it's covered with dust. And you send it back to Micometrics. And Micometrics will cheerfully tell you in about a week what your relative moldiness index will be. And the typical scores range minus 10 to minus, from minus 10 to 20. I have yet to have one of my clients return one for me, so I'm waiting to see some. I've told about 50 people to get one, but I'm waiting for the results to start coming in. Uh, and the mic, what you'll start, what, if you don't have a safe home, it doesn't do you any good to treat you. Because I can treat you all I want, but you keep going back to the dirty home, and you're not going to be any good. We want you at least at a level of, probably down to a level of two at the worst. And so if you're any worse than that, yes? I can't see the screen. My apologies. So the company, mycometrics.com, you, they don't want to just mail you a kit just because you're curious. They'll charge you 50 bucks to send you the Swiffer cloth. Uh, and so that'll be 50 bucks of the total cost, and then they, you pay for the rest of the cost to get the rest of it once you send it in. 
So they, you can't just sort of say, just send me a test kit. You have to be serious about actually doing it. But they will send you, they also do a test called hurts me, which sounds like, don't hurt me. But hurts me is also another way of looking at the mold effect in the environment. And you can get that. It's another way of looking at it. And I, I should probably add that as my next slide, but I didn't have that one today. Von Willebrand's factor. Who knows, who here has ever had a, heard of Von, von Willebrand's? You've heard of it? Yes, people who bruise real easily. Von Willebrand's is a natural defect where you get easy bleeding and brooding. But you know there's such a thing as acquired Von Willebrand's. And these are proteins that can't assemble because C4A makes them so they can't assemble. So they can't put themselves together. So guess what happens to these folks? They're easy bleeders. They get nosebleeds. And so you see some people who say, I'm getting nosebleeds all the time. I don't know why I'm getting all these nosebleeds. What's going on with all these nosebleeds? Help me here. I've never had nosebleeds before. So if that hasn't happened to you, I don't see any aha moments coming in anybody's eyes in the audience. So. But that would be something you'd say you'd want to pay attention to. Because you get sudden, out of the blue, monster nosebleeds. Uh, MMP9 is matrix metallo... I'm just going through all the testing you can do. MMP9 is matrix metallopeptidase 9. It basically is the sum of all the cytokine effects. It goes through the roof. And it's a regulatory factor. Neutrophil migration plays several functions, such as degrading the extracellular matrix, activation of, of a couple other cytokines. But it becomes a sum measure of how high your mold illness is. It's like another, it's like TGF beta 1. It's a sum measure of how much you're being affected. Marcons. How many of you have heard of Marcons? Oh, good, at least half of you. Uh, how many know what Staph epidermidis is? Staph epidermidis is what? It's the Staph that's growing on every one of your skin. If you take a swab to your forehead, to your, to your forearm, to your finger, to your armpit, wherever part of every part of your body, there's Staph epidermidis. It's always growing there. We sort of said, oh, that's a commensal organism, no big deal. Well, it, is, it turns out it is a big deal. Because if you get it on a heart valve, if you've got it on a heart valve, you, you can't cure it with antibiotics. You have to take that heart valve out and put in a new heart valve. If you get it on a joint, when somebody's doing a total joint, you can't cure that total joint. You have to take that joint out. So staph epidermis is a big deal. But something curious happens with staph epidermidis. Multiple antibiotic resistant coag negative staph in your nose. When your MSH, when your melanocyte stimulating hormone drops, Staph epidermidis that's on your skin, that's multiple antibiotic resistant, gets in your nose. And it puts out two little nasty little proteins. And those two little proteins break down <coughs> MSH. And so now you have something living in your nose that keeps breaking down the MSH. So you get something started with mold, but you've got a little engine in your nose that keeps it going. So MSH lowers your immune system, so you get an invasion of a bug into a biofilm in your nose, and it's in a biofilm that antibiotics can't get to, and it's living in your nose. And how Shoemaker found that, Lord knows. But we now think that Alzheimer's disease is driven by Marcons in about 10 to 20 percent of Mar Alzheimer's patients. And that if you want to keep somebody from getting Alzheimer's, one of the things you have to test them for somewhere on their journey is a Marcons. And so guess how many labs in Milwaukee are used to testing for Marcons? The answer for that would be zero. But Aurora has said they're very interested in it. They'd love to develop the capability of doing it right. Shoemaker says he sends it only to one lab. There's only one lab that does a good place. Well, it's a pain in the butt to send it to only one lab in America. So I'm trying to see if I can talk Aurora into doing it properly and getting the labs to to them to do it. And this story will be worked out as we see if we can actually do it. But I have had a patient sent to me from the Cleveland Clinic who is worried about getting Alzheimer's. And they sent a kit along with him to test him for Marcons, 
and that kid is now being cultured and sent off to that national lab. And he, is an, he had a early onset Alzheimer's from having had multiple concussions, mm. but they want to make sure he doesn't have Marcon's in his nose. So Marcon's isn't just with mold illness, it might be in multiple issues because it might be because it may be that mold illness is common enough that it's why so many people are getting Alzheimer's. I don't know which comes first, but stay tuned. This is an interesting story. But if you're going to fix mold, you've got to fix Marcon's. You've got to fix Marcon's. So that's on the journey of doing it. And it takes something called beg spray to clear it, which Dan can make for us. Dan's already made a couple prescriptions here of beg spray. And so hopefully we will get that developed. And if you're going to treat Marcon's, you actually have to do two things to fix it. VEGF. VEGF everybody knows about because anti-VEGF medications are hot deals right now with cancer and chemotherapy because this is a nerve growth factor for cancer patients. So there's all sorts of chemotherapy drugs that attack VEGF. But VEGF is simply a way of getting your blood vessels, oh, I need to put the name in. I'm not sure I got the name right, so I'm, I don't, I'll call it VEGF. But it turns out if you don't have proper VEGF, you don't get proper capillary flow. Well, TGF beta 1 and MMP9 and C4 all damage VEGF. So you stop getting capillary flow through your capillaries. If you don't get good capillary flow through your capillaries, you don't get good flow through your brain. If you don't get good flow through your brain, what happens to your visual acuity for white and black dots? Mm -hmm. It decreases. What happens to your brain fog? It goes up. What happens to your memory? It goes to mush because your computer isn't getting enough amperage. You aren't getting enough energy through to your brain because you don't have good blood flow to your brain. So VEGF is one of the most, but you can measure that with a blood test. And I've actually already had two people come back with low VEGFs. I'm thinking, okay, so we're on to something. So pop quiz. What does MSH stand for? Nobody here would know because I had MSF. F. Manilonocyte stimulating hormone. Good. All right. What inflammatory protein goes sky high on third exposure? One exposure, two exposure, three exposure. Pow. TGF beta 1. TGF beta 1. Okay. What happens with high TGF beta 1? You ruin VEGF. And that makes for poor circulation and fatigue and brain fog and all sorts of trouble thinking. See, we're going to go over this one more complete time. You're going to see it from the, the way of treatment. We're going to go back. I'm doing the diagnostic test. I'm going to do the whole thing through treatment, and we'll go through the whole sequence again so you get to hear it all over again. Okay? So step one, how are we going to treat it? So let's go through the treatment program. This gets you one more time. We're going to review it so you're going to see everything going through the whole thing and how we treat it and how do you fix it. Yes? Well, that's a good question. There's a, a Shoemaker Schum has written a book called Surviving Mold, mm -hmm. and he has, he has also has a, I'm taking his mold course right now, and he has a book he's written for, for us, I don't know if it's for the general public, called 500 Questions. <laughs> and one of his questions is, is there a list of tests I should take? And his answer is, no. He said, you should measure all of them because you don't know which ones are going to be right or wrong. Huh about several other authors who are now beginning to get and establish their own practice and write about it and comment and make little seminars say, oh, give me a break. You're going to bankrupt the bank. You can't do all 25 of those tests. So I'm sort of in that camp. But I'm just at the learning stage. I've only been doing this for six months now, so I'm kind of at the learning stage. And I've been checking about five or six. TGF beta 1, melanocyte stimulating hormone, the HLA test, you know, I've, and the problem is, is I've not been getting HLA tests back, so I've only been getting two or three back. So I'm sort of at that stage of being slightly frustrated. And, but I haven't heard from anybody that they've had to pay huge co-pays, but we're, you know, it takes six months to get your bills back and find out, because the medical system is not hasty at telling you how much things cost. You know, they don't tell you good feedback right away, so I don't know and haven't had feedback on that yet. But uh, 
That's what I listed at the beginning. I would say melanocyte stimulating hormone, TGF beta 1, uh, the, uh, the tissue typing, the, the tissue typing, and probably C4 and C3A, those are probably a reasonable first start. Okay? So step number one, when you're thinking of when you're thinking of mold, here's the way of treatment protocol, and here's the of thinking it through. So step number one, this is Shoemaker publishes his, what he calls his 11-step program. So step number one is consider exposure. And that is, says, fungal fragments from 0.3 to point, 0 0.03 to 0 0.3 microns are shed from fungal colonies. And those fine particulates are shed by all sorts of uh, stachyboitrous. So fragments are readily deposited in the nasal cavity. So how many people have heard about nose exposure in cities and toxins and living in cities. Okay, this is something you should all know about. So pollution studies show that particulates matter in your nose get into your brain. This came out last September. It, uh, microtoxins be detected in the sera of occupants exposed to duck. How does it get into your blood? But let me show you how. We can show in mice and rats that when you expose them to microspheres in their nose, they get into their brain. How do they get into their brain? Because you have open pores from your brain in your nose. That's called your smell sensors. At the top of your nose, you've got smell sensors. And that's the most primitive part of our brain. That's our lizard brain. It's, it's the very most primitive part. But there's research that shows that if you look at human brains, this was published in BBC September 6, 2016, one million particles per gram of brain tissue, only 200 nanometers in diameter. So a hair is 50,000 nanometers. So this is much, 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 much smaller than the width of a hair. Those little tiny particles get into your brain. Okay? And if you live, there's been research that shows if you live in proximity to a big highway, uh, I think this was done in Mexico City. Folks who live within 100 feet of a big highway are about three to four IQ points dumber because that stuff gets into your brain and damages your brain. That's distressing. That's just distressing. You don't want to live next to, you know, it's those diesel fumes and the microparticles of big cities. And that's why the Clean Air Act is a really important part of our culture. We want to keep our air clean because those microparticles really are dangerous. Okay, so most of us can tolerate mold because 75% of us have immune system that recognize it, see it, tag it, clean it up. Those folks don't get sick. And this is my understanding, this is my belief why the House of Medicine has missed it. Because the House of Medicine tends to take 200 random people and check them against 200 other random people. And when only 2% of people get sick, they get lost in the mix. So you don't see it. Uh, but here's what's... Uh, Another article that was written in Clinical Microbiology Reviews in 2003, Indoor Mold, Toxigenic Fungi, Tachybotrys. And this is what everybody refers to who are against mold as an illness. They say, at the end of the day, they say, this really isn't that big a problem. So that's why the House of Medicine up till now has said, well, the experts sort of say it's not that big a deal. When I go searching in my PubMed, this is what I find. And that means they've missed the picture, and that's what we're still fighting against. Because those 25 to 30 percent of people whose genes are troubled, this is why you have to have that blood test that goes to, uh, the, to the right lab so you can identify it properly. And it's a disaster for those folks who are, who are really super sensitive. So how do you tell if you're really super sensitive? It's that HLA-DR testing. Okay. And you can look that up. So what happens next? It's very important to notice that it's not a dose related. When you get, when you drink alcohol, you're drinking a biological poison that has some beneficial effects for which you're willing to tolerate some of the poison. And so you have a dose related response. And up to a certain point, it's kind of fun and your mother-in-law's jokes are funny. <laughs> and after that point, she no longer thinks your jokes are funny at all. Or no, I'm not sure where that switches over. Uh, 
there's a dose-related response, but mold is not a dose-related response. It's an exposure, a simple exposure, and it's a hair trigger on a nuclear bomb because that explosion is like a cascade of dominoes. And you have thousands of little proteins, each one of which multiplies to thousands of other proteins that multiply incredibly quickly. And we've seen that happen in a couple other places, the most dramatic of which is the influenza epidemic of 1918 where people were described to die from influenza within 12 hours. They would get the flu and in 12 hours, young people who had never had the flu before would be dead. And that's the fear of another flu epidemic. That's why I personally believe everybody should get flu shots despite all the anxiety about flu and because in fact it's those cytokine storms with influenza that kill large numbers of people. And we haven't had a flu epidemic in 60 years. After having them every 20 years for 5,000 years, now we haven't had a good epidemic for 60 years because enough of the population is just below the radar with flu shots. Okay, something, but something like bee sting. When you get a bee sting, you see people getting super sick real fast. And in pandemics and probably the same thing, it just explodes. So once in the body, the toxin binds to many receptors, setting off continual upregulation, those cytokines, each activating thousands, and split products and TGF beta 1. And TGF beta 1 goes to cells and sets off all sorts of cascades in cells that get things going, and you can hardly map those, those cytokines, do all sorts of things inside the cell. They turn on all sorts of messages you can't keep track of because it's like the whole life of the cell gets turned on. But what's interesting now is we're beginning to recognize, and this is not what I got from Shoemaker, this is what I got from the other mold folks, that folks who get chronic sinusitis, if you've had antibiotics twice for your sinuses, you've got fungus in your mold, and it's no longer a bacterial back infection. And you go back to your doctor and say, I want a stronger antibiotic, and your doctor gives you something else, and then I want a stronger antibiotic, give you something else. Well, even five years ago in the ER, I was having ENT doctors say, why don't you give them an antifungal and try that? And so I was beginning to give antifungals about five. So traditional medicine has started to recognize that once you've had an antibiotic treated for a bit, and I think that's where traditional medicine is beginning to see the reservoir effect of Marcon's in the nose. But what we now know is you get a biofilm in your nose, and the sinuses become one of the places where you get this chronic infection. And you see those the mycotoxin is produced in the sinuses, and they can be there because you can find in the, in the urine of patients who have SIRS, you can find those mycotoxins, and you can find the biofilms in their noses. And if you treat directly with antifungals, you can treat some of those. So some people, some ENT doctors at some, at one, the seminar I heard from last fall was an ENT doctor who is treating patients with all kinds of different fungals and, and actually curing them by his aggressive, very, very aggressive antifungal treatment just in the nose. Okay, I don't think he was curing the whole thing, but he was curing the fungal element of it. And then a pulmonary doctor gets up and says, you can get the same biofilms in your lungs. And if you have an adult onset with asthma who starts wheezing and coughing and having all sorts of asthma symptoms, that maybe that's not GERD, maybe that's adult onset asthma, maybe a biofilm in the lungs after mold exposure. And I'm going, oh my. So I'm now looking around looking for folks who say, I was fine until I was 62 years old and then I got asthma. And I think those people do exist because when I used to be in the ER, I'd see them here and there. And I think they have mold because they've got another reservoir. So I think what's happened is we've got two chronic reservoirs that drive this disease where we get biofilms going, one in our noses and the others in our lungs. Uh, and those cytokine effects then fan out, and our glial cells in our brain, our brain is two kinds of cells, computer chips and insulation. The computer chips are the neurons that, do the, that actually are processing the information, but the glia are the inflammatory, are the white cells that wrap around and the, make the blood-brain barrier and they respond like white cells. They're inflammatory cells. And once you get these cytokines going in the rest of your body, they're going in your brain. And once they're going in your brain, they attach to the leptin receptor and damage it. 
and you get a damaged leptin receptor, and the leptin receptor is responsible for turning on melanocyte-stimulating hormone. But if you have a damaged leptin receptor in your brain, if you have a damaged leptin receptor in your brain, you can't make melanocyte-stimulating hormone. So leptin becomes worthless. So your leptin can get higher and higher and higher, and you become leptin resistant. And what happens when you become leptin resistant? You can't lose weight and you get fat. So we can make you gain weight, and then your MSH drops, and you then don't, you can't protect yourself from infections, and MSH also doesn't help you make pain control, so you're overweight and tired and hurt all over, and we call that chronic fatigue syndrome. Or fibromyalgia, because we can't name it any other way. Pop quiz. A common place for persistent mold infections. Sinuses. If you've been on two antibiotics, for sure. Even traditional medicine is accepting that now. Two, cytokines responds, respond with dose-related activity. True or false? False. It's nuclear bomb activity. Any exposure can be triggering. Leptin receptors become damaged, resulting in the lowering of what critical hormone? Melanocyte-stimulating hormone. That's thought to be one of the critical... Kick, that's the critical kicking off step. The cytokines circulate to your brain, damage the leptin receptor, and MSH can't come on. So cytokine effects continue. They then make you release uh, MMP9. Uh, you can measure that. And it's an important zinc protein that breaks down tissue, dissolving matrix holding cells, also important in wound healing uh, and part of the pathway. And it damages the blood brain barrier. And it's inhibited by curcumin and resveratrol and ber berberine. And so all these things that you've taken at one time or another, and see, it felt like you got a little bit of effect for a couple of weeks, and then it faded. It worked for a couple of weeks. I don't know why it didn't keep working. Because you didn't treat enough of the whole picture. You didn't get around to enough of it. And you get mu headache and muscle aches and variable temperature and trouble concentrating. And these are all coming from low MSH. And so and we're going to get to that next slide. And then you get reduced VEGF, and VEG is vascular endothelial growth factor, and that stimulates white cells to migrate, but they don't let blood flow because they get into the capillaries, so your white cells plug up all your capillaries, so you don't get blood flow through your brain and through your muscles, and so you feel tired. You feel fatigued all the time, and muscle cramps, and shortness of breath. So you can measure VEGF, and son of a gun, it gets too low. Okay. And certain, then you can, then oh, here's the immune effects from the certain cytokines. We don't have to go into that because that's, we've already talked about that. But some of the immune effects are the very, very high C4A. And that's a connector protein at the other, with, other, with other pathways. So you start seeing C3 and C4A get affected in the, these complement pathways as we go through the activation of our immune system. And so our immune system gets damaged, it gets broken, it gets ineffective, it gets spastic. It does a whole bunch of things. But I want to show you this to help you explain why it's, so, why it's a little bit complicated to understand. Who's ever heard of POMC? Pro-opiomelanocortin. If you remember that one, next time you play Big Boggle, you can pull that one out. Pro-opiomelanocortin. This is the protein that you can make 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 proteins from. You can make 10 hormones from one protein, depending on which activating chopping protein you chop it with. If you chop it with, you know, depending which kinase you activate, you make different sizes. They all overlap each other. They all overlap each other. But this protein is the initial matrix you make all these other proteins from. So when you get mold illness in your brain, you start making demand on using this and everything gets concentrated down one pathway and everything else gets depleted. Because you're using up everything trying to make MSH, you're trying to make MSH and it gets all used up here so you don't have anything left over to make all these other ones. And your MSH is low, so you try to put out more, make more MSH to catch up, and then you use up all the other ones. 
So you end up with everything getting dysfunctional. And that's one thing, that's a hypothesis I'm putting out. But that's what makes sense because that's what we see happening. We see the whole system falling apart and getting dysfunctional. And low MSH is, so the POMC is made deep in the hypothalamus, but it, when it makes for low MSH, everything goes bad. So production of MSH is typically driven by leptin that normally determines holding on to fat. High leptin makes you weight loss resistant, but the inflammation that lowers MSH is also then prevents you from getting good night's sleep, makes you have make pain, makes you gain weight, and all those things happen together, and everybody who has chronic fatigue syndrome says, that sounds like me. I can't sleep at night, I can't lose weight, I ache all over, I have chronic infections, I'm so tired, I can't stand it, I can't sleep, please give me something to help me sleep. And so then they go to a doctor and they get a benzodiazepine and they get addicted to benzodiazepine and now they've got a second problem on top of everything else. Uh, and that's what we call chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. So low MSH lowers immune function. Didn't if I said that enough time, do you got that? You get leaky gut and further compromise. Remember, that causes what? You get allergic to what common food? Wheat, Wheat. gluten. Okay, white blood cells lose regulation, and so their op opportunistic infections show up, uh, the most common of which is Marcon's, and that gets started. And where does Marcon's get started? Nose. Nose. Good. So here's Shoemaker's biological pathway. He tries to put everything on one page. <laughs> Whew. And basically, it's you get the biotoxin. It gets on the surface of a fat cell and puts out cytokines. He thinks that's where it gets started. The cytokines damage an insulin receptor, the insulin receptor, the leptin receptor. The leptin receptor is responsible for making MSH. MSH is in the middle of everything. So if you screw up MSH, you're off to the races because now everything else follows. Everything else follows. So here's the HLA, here's the fat cell, here's the leptin receptor, here's the reduced MSH, and then you've got sleep disturbance, chronic pain, gastrointestinal issues, prolonged illness of one kind or another, resistant staph bacteria, uh, changes in cortisol, ACTH, reduced sex hormones, reduced ADH. ADH, ever heard of that? Do you know what ADH does? Okay, let's, we'll talk about that in a minute. Pop quiz. Name three results of MSH. I just listed 10 of them all in a minute. Yeah, I forgot you all have mold illness, so you can't remember any of them. <laughs> Can't sleep, can't lose weight, hurt all over, brain fog, leaky gut, immune dysfunction. And if you say all five of those to any internal medicine doctor, they won't let you schedule a second appointment. Because they'll say, oh my God, deer in headlights. Right? What super protein is the source of MSH? pro opio melanocortin nine syllables. Remember, if you can say something over four syllables, you don't get Alzheimer's. So, so practice that one, okay? I'm going to use that as my password on my computer, so if you want to come to my clinic, no. Okay. VEGF is lowered by cytokines effects and results in what? VEGF lowering plugs up blood vessels and what does that cause? Brain fog, fatigue all over. Brain fog, blood clamp flow because the white cells crowd out in capillaries. Marcon's. Okay, I've now gone over Marcon's three times. Marcon's is a biofilm in your nose, and to treat it, and basically it's a layer of dead, gunky stuff with mold and dead white cells and protein and gunk. But coag negative staph gets going and puts out two nasty proteins that cleave any MSH that's left. So you have to treat. Marcons. But you can't treat it until you've taken the VEGF first, until, you, until you've taken this, the cholestyramine. And so Marcons harms the immune system by biofilm, nasal mucosa, we've been through that. Low MSH, I've told you this before about five times now. Fatigue, pain, and inflammation, chronic sleep disorder, sweet, night sweats, loss of control of body temperature. Leaky gut, poor <laughs> ADH. And we're going to get to ADH just a minute here. Uh, so, POMC or 
MSH now is central to it, and low PMC is part of all that happening. And so, oopsie, did my going backwards? Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go, I'm sorry. Notice that MSH is made from ACTH. If you don't have ACTH, what happens to your cortisol cycle? If you're putting all your energy into making MSH, then you aren't making ACTH, because ACTH is cut in half to make MSH. Okay. So what happens to your cortisol cycle? Your normal cortisol cycle should look like this, right? In the morning, you should have a burst of cortisol that makes you feel alert and awake and full of energy and ready to go. At this time of night, you should be falling asleep. I'm amazed that anybody's awake. God bless you. We only got 10 more minutes, just 10 more minutes. Okay. That keeps you awake. But here's somebody who's gone to ACTH and cortisol. Again, you should get spikes early in the morning, late at night. Here's the ACTH cycling, and then here's their cortisol early in the day. Okay. So messed up pituitary function, because you're using up all that POMC, leads to decreased ADH production. So what does decreased ADH pro Antidiuretic hormone. Your pituitary makes antidiuretic hormone to protect what? critical function in you. One of the most important things your body protects is your concentration of sodium. So I want a blood sodium of 140. If I drink a glass of water, what's going to happen to my blood sodium if I hang on to all of it? My blood sodium will go down. So what do my kidneys do? Pee it out. So if I drink two glasses of water, what will my kidneys do? Pee it out unless I'm extremely dehydrated. So if you don't have ADH, that's antidiuretic hormone. What happens if you don't have antidiuretic hormone? You pee too much water out, and your sodium concentration rises. And you raise the concentration of salt in your tissue. And guess what happens when you raise the concentration of salt? you get electrical shocks easily. But you're also functionally dehydrated. And you stand up and you feel like you're really dizzy and you have to sit down. And you feel dizzy so you drink another glass of water, but your, but your brain isn't making ADH, and so you drink a glass of water and you pee it out. Now, most people, when they're doing that, haven't eaten enough salt. And if you just give them a couple of tablespoons of salt in a bouillon cube, they'll be fine. Most people. But mold illness can't fix themselves. And they keep drinking, 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 and they're getting up and peeing all night long, and they're trying to keep up with it and drink all night long. So you measure their serum sodium concentration. And if their serum sodium concentration is too high, that's a classic symptom of mold illness. And their ADH concentration is all out of whack, leading to freak. Oftentimes, they'll say, I have supposedly have electric shocks. But their total blood volume is low, which means when they stand up, they don't get enough blood to their head, so they feel lightheaded and dizzy. And you feel kind of woozy, and you feel like washed out, and blah. Ever felt that way? Anytime you go on a diet and don't eat for a couple of minutes, you'll do that. But many people feel that way if they don't eat salt regularly, and then don't have, if they don't have enough insulin secretion, their kidneys won't hang on to salt water, and they'll do that by that. So in that circumstance, eating salt will fix it. Yes? So a salt pill. Yeah, you can take a salt pill and fix it. Right. You can take a salt pill and fix it. Or Tabasco sauce, much preferable. <laughs> I'd much prefer the Tabasco sauce, personally. Yes? And then what about low blood pressure contributing to that? Well, low blood pressure contributing that puts you just closer to the edge. But your body, if you have generally low blood pressure, your body gets used, more used to that low blood pressure, and your system should be more used to accommodating for that, but you're just closer to the edge. So you've got fewer, a smaller margin for... Yes? What kind of salt did you say that you take? I personally take Tabasco salt. I mean, Tabasco sauce. Tabasco. <laughs> I like spicy food, so I buy, I, I, I have something called Slap Your Mama Hot Sauce. It's basically salt with chili pepper in it. And, but that's my own eccentricity. OK. Uh, but how many people do you know have been called with Potts syndrome? Right? You've heard of Potts syndrome, where people say they pass out all the time because they're that's probably, that might be folded into mold illness. I can't wait to see that research coming out. I have a suspicion that that's going to be part of mold illness somewhere along the line. 
or it may be just a separate diagnosis, but it'll be interesting to see that play out. Uh, in the meantime, because if you're messing up your pituitary, you get down regulation of sex hormones and up regulation of cortisol because you're screwing up all the POMC and so you're dragging everything down to MSH, but you can't make MSH because you keep using it up and you don't have enough POMC for everything else. So everything else gets depleted. So everything else is going down to trying to restore, trying to restore MSH and can't do it. Uh-oh. I forgot to put in the, you get freebie tests on this one. <laughs> the propensity of intellectual shocks comes from altered sodium balance, poor ADH secretion. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. Okay, it's put out by your pituitary gland. ACTH is your main energy hormone, true or false? That's your main waking you up energy hormone in the morning. Okay, now treatment. So this is the third time through, so you should know it by now. Okay? Step one. I can't fix you if I don't get you away from the environment. So how do I know if your house is safe? I do a ERMI test. Mycometrics.com. For 50 bucks, they'll mail it to you. See, now you're getting it. See, you're getting it. Three times through, you're getting it. So here's the ERMI test. A simple algorithm used to calculate a ratio of water damage rate species to common indoor moles resulting scores called the environmental relative molding essay. And I formatted that poorly. I didn't know that was coming through like that. Sorry, that should have shown that in the background. Okay. No level of exposure safe. The immune system cascade with the tiniest dose once activated, emphatically not dose related, just exposure related, making it difficult. So I've said that enough times. Remove the toxin. How do we remove the toxin? I gave you a clue earlier. What did, cold, what did Shoemaker treat people with? Cholestyramine. The toxin keeps circulating. Cholestyramine binds it perfectly. It's an old-fashioned drug. But if you're going to take cholestyramine, you're probably better off if you spend seven days earlier building up your immune system with fish oil. Two grams, two grams a day and a very low amylose diet. What does a low amylose diet mean? No root vegetables and no grains. No root vegetables and no grains. And that looks like, so here's what cholestyramine looks like. It's a molecule that's thousands of things long. And these are the binding sites, and they just have thousands and thousands of binding sites that binds the mold quite tightly. It's actually quite good at binding the mold. Low amylose diet means no root vegetables, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beets, no peanuts, no bananas, no rice, no wheat, no rye, no barley, oats. So no grains, no bananas, peanuts, or root vegetables. So relatively all the green vegetables, above ground vegetables, all you want. Coconut oil, meat, animal protein, all you want. Um, you haven't mentioned how to prune the environment. Oh, that's a whole ball of wax. That's another whole lecture all by itself. If you're living in a house and want to clean the environment, it's uh, the only thing you can keep, if you really are dangerously ill, the only thing you can keep is something glass or ceramic. Uh, anything made of fabric or carpet or clothing or leather, you will not clean from mold. Uh, there are numerous examples of people getting sick from the slightest item that they've taken with them. There are numerous examples of people taking a file cabinet of papers and getting sick with the file cabinet. Uh, there's an example of a person getting sick by taking his favorite saxophone with him. And so that was called a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> you know. But that's how sensitive some people are. So there are specialists around who say they are good at doing it, but I don't believe that anybody can do it as lovingly and carefully as you can. But Shoemaker has on his website, Surviving Mold, how to clean out your home. And it is not easy. It requires exquisite detail to do it. And, some, and folks who are really ex uh, that sensitive may require changing homes because your current home may not be able to do it. Yeah, it's really serious. Did you have you changed a home? I, I haven't changed. Uh, we cleaned a uh, successfully. Yeah, um, with directions from Shoemaker. Right. Uh, um, and and if you're going to do it yourself, 
which you do need to be part of it. Um, there, there's so many aspects of it. You need to be very cautious with wearing masks. Right. And, um, but yeah, it's it's complicated because you said so many. If you move, so many places have mold. So if it's yeah. possible, and right. it depends the degree and what your HLA right. type is. So I have, I have though the worst HLA type. You so have a bad type. Yeah, I have a bad type. They're building on my cul-de-sac. They're building a house across from us. And they've just gotten the first two foundations built, but they don't have the roof. Guess what's been happening for the last three weeks? This is an 8,000 square foot house. And I'm thinking, oh dear. Get that roof on quickly. I'm hoping they, before any black spots start showing up, they get it done. Uh, clean up Marcons. Oh, once you've treated somebody, so cholestyramine, is you treat four times a day for a month, and it's a packet of uh, it's a packet of this uh, agent you mix in water and drink it. It makes you quite constipated. It can be difficult to do. It can take quite a while to get it done properly. I don't know if any of you have tried taking it. M many people can only do two packets a day, and they might take three or four months to get cleaned up. Uh, Shoemaker says absolutely everybody can take four a day. Sounds like he's a pretty rigid drill master. Uh, there's another drug called Wellcall that works about, has a one-fifth the binding sites of cholestyramine, and that works as well, but it's slower because it's one-fifth the binding site. Uh, but clean up Marcon's. So oral and topical antibiotic, beg spray is the topical spray. The antibiotic is rifampin, and you take rifampin and beg spray for a month, and that cleans up Marcon's. I've now had one person successfully do it, so I know it works, and you have to culture them twice. But that's where I'm in. So pop quiz. What are the first three treatment steps? Remove from exposure. Remove the toxin. Clean up Marcon's. What three drugs are used in these steps? Cholestyramine, beg spray, rifampin. Okay. How long does it take to do these steps? One month each. So in two months, that part should be better. It, this is not a five-year treatment course of Lyme disease. This is two months. You should be better. Okay. Step four, fix gluten antibodies. Well, that's a blood test and take, away off, take off a of wheat. So the spastic immune response, that's not complicated. Get off a of wheat. Now, if positive, you might check for celiac disease if you do the blood tests. But step five, fix abnormal antigen. Uh, Part of that whole process is you ruin this enzyme called aromatase, but if you give somebody DHEA, they'll start making their own androgens again. Or men might need an HCG shot here or there, or somewhere along the line, VIP spray. If you don't succeed at this, VIP spray will recover it. But many people will have their testosterone dramatically lowered, which is important for men and women. You need testosterone for immune function. Okay? Correct ADH abnormalities. That's your antidiuretic hormone. Keeps you from getting dehydrated. You can fix it with something called desmopressin. And you can fix it in 10 nights. This is not a complicated thing. 10 nights of desmopressin, and you're now getting back, you're now getting back in, your body's recovering. It's learning how to do stuff again. It's fixing. Fix MMP9. Turns out Actos fixes MMP9. And a diabetes drug. Fascinating. Or just a whole boatload of fish oil. But you can take Actos in just 10 weeks, or 10 days, two weeks, you're fixed. For whatever reason, it calms down MMP9 and calms it down again. I think that's correct C3A. Statins clear out C3A. This is the one reason to take a statin. Statins clean up C3A. But before you can take a statin, make sure you're on CoQ10 for 10 days. Because you, you don't, this is probably where statins work. They're, it's an anti-inflammatory drug and calms down C3A. But in mold illness, that's where it works. So it, it works, so it's kind of nice. C4A. C4A is actually a little more complicated. I haven't gotten here yet. I don't have any customer gotten here, but this is where you, you to treat the acquired von Willebrand's factor, you have to give something, uh, you, have, you have to treat it with, uh, uh, where is it? Oh, I don't have, I thought I had a slide that came over at the top of it. Procrit, there we go, right. So you have to give Procrit 
Five shots of Procrit are given in a supervised fashion over a 15-day period. And that apparently causes a fair number of side effects. So that's a, I'm sort of uh, looking forward to finishing up my training with, uh, with uh, Shoemaker to figure out how to do this Procrit stuff. That has me a little on the anxious side still. Because you have to get a complete blood count after each time you give Procrit. And I had high C4A, and I didn't have to do anything. But it would have, when all the other things... They just left you alone for a while, and it calmed down on its own? You didn't get nosebleeds. If you were having nosebleeds, you'd have to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were having tons of nosebleeds, they would have done it. Right. Uh, but see, acquired von Willebrands is 1 in 5,000 of the population, 1 in 40 people of SIRS. So you're 1 of 39. Mm -hmm. You're in the 39 instead of the 40th. Uh, uh, and then finally, correct TGF-beta. And guess what? Kozar, Losartan, fixes TGF-beta-1. So if you have a high TGF-beta-1, you can fix it. You know how long it takes? A month. You can fix it quickly. So many of these other steps that are abnormalities, you go by and see what your blood tests are, and you can go through in a sequential fashion. There's something to treat each one of them, depending on what you have. You can fix everything else. This isn't all that complicated once you've broken it down to all that, once you sort of see that big picture. There's about 10 steps that you can go through. And the last step is if nothing else has worked, if the person is in a safe place with an ERMI under 2, or hurts me greater than 10, they don't, if Marcon's is gone, and their VCS is still abnormal, then you'd put on VIP spray, one spray each nostril four times a day. And VIP spray will fix everybody. Did you ever go on v VIP spray? No, that's where I got it up to, and thank goodness. My yeah. Um, Apparently, there are people who've been on v VIP spray now five, six years, because that's about, he discovered it all about 10 years ago, and he says there are, he has some patients who've been on it just they get their lives back, they feel normal, they feel great. So you go from being completely crippled, unable to leave your house, unable to go into different places, and you're back to functioning. So this wicked illness, and I'm not sure I've given a clear picture tonight, but this wicked illness that's put so many people in a hidden fashion, hiding in their homes, staying out of the public, feeling chronically fatigued and belittled by the medical, the me medical profession, has some hope attached to it. So I'm kind of excited about it. I want to see, I'm, I'm sort of, hot to trot, I'm so mad at the medical system they can't do my lab tests for me, it's driving me crazy. So candidates for VIP should have decreased VIP levels, increased pulmonary artery pressure when you test them, and failure to regain their MSH control. So this is, you know, and, and Shoemaker is just adamant you have to do every one of those steps because a lot of these tests cost a fair amount of money, and oftentimes it's somebody, it's somebody else who caused you to get sick. So I have one of my clients who's not here tonight, for example, who lives in a home that her whole, hall, her whole back hallway was, she was in a condo, and it was just completely mold covered. Oh. And the condo association wouldn't take ownership of it. And she moved out and told everybody, hey guys, you, this, your, your, your whole building's gonna go down the tubes. And sure enough, the entire building is now condemned. Oh. They didn't pay attention to it, didn't do it. And her condo, she's lost her building. Oh. And I don't know who's responsible. You know, when the condo association refused, this is why living in a condo and having to get four other people to fix your wall is crazy, sometimes crazy making. So the treatment plan nuance, cholestyramine was invented for cholesterol. You use it away from food, it's four grams, can be very constipating. Uh, you try to get to four, may not be able to. Uh, well call is a good alternative. And you should know that this may be something, a lot of these steps may be useful for folks with chronic Lyme disease. It may be those people who've had chronic Lyme disease, you've treated them and cured their Lyme, but they haven't gotten the toxin out of them yet. And so to some degree, they have to go through these steps and measures to see if they've gotten the Lyme toxin out. And that may, so this last year, there was a whole hoo-ha at the Lyme conference at ILADS about how Lyme disease may be part of the SIRS syndrome, and we've got to get savvier at figuring out how to get the toxins out of people as we treat the Lyme and get rid of the Lyme disease. So the summary, biotoxin goes in the body, causes local inflammation in fat cells, cytokines go to the, helmus, the hypothalamus and damage leptin. Leptin becomes elevated. It lowers MSH, which results in weight gain, pain, fatigue, foggy brain. Functional extreme cytokine response leads to overwhelming and few inflammatory responses, and that all becomes self-sustaining.
If you can just think that, just summarize that, that's not so complicated. <laughs> Final exam. Nosebleeds come from the high C4 acquired von Willebrands. VI spray builds up what? <coughs> Everything, but MSH most importantly. How long might someone need VIP? We're not sure. Maybe a lifetime. A high TGF beta 1 is reduced with what blood pressure drug? Losartan. Okay. If you know those four, look at how much more you knew than you knew an hour ago. Good work. Any questions?